between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of. And on to this, Conan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another installment of Conan Chronicles. As always, I'm your host, Dan, and today we're going to be taking a look at yet another Conan short story. This one is called The Queen of the Black Coast. It's uh, Robert E. Howard's 10th Conan story ever published, and it was first seen in the May 1934 issue of Weird Tales magazine. Our story begins in a moment of action. As Conan is fleeing from the authorities of the city, he finds himself in at the beginning. The desperate barbarian leaps from his horse onto the deck of a nearby ship, just about to depart for the distant coast of Kush. The stunned ship captain, a man named Tito, asks the Sumerian who he is and whether he can pay for his passage to Kush. Conan roars that he pays his way in steel gesturing towards his sword, and threatens the captain, promising him that if he didn't take off immediately, Conan plans to paint the deck red with the blood of the captain and his crew. The captain hurriedly agrees, and Conan barely manages to escape the crossbowmen who had been pursuing him out onto the open seas. After Conan speaks with the captain for some time, he finds a kindred spirit in him, the two agree to enjoy a tankard of ale together. After Conan speaks with the captain, he finds a kindred spirit within him, and the two agree to enjoy a tankard of ale together. Conan and the crew travel together for a long time, and at one point Conan asks about what the ship's defenses were. The captain, bound to Kush to trade beads, silks, sugar, swords, ivory, copper, slaves, and pearls, regales Conan with a story of a savage cutthroat that roams the seas. Mine is no warship. We run, not fight. Yet if it came to a pinch, we have beaten off reavers before and might do it again. Unless it were Belit's tigress. Who is Belit? The wildest she-devil unhanged. Unless I read the signs are wrong. It was her butchers who destroyed that village on the bay. May I someday see her dangling from the yard arm. She is called the Queen of the Black Coast. She is a Shemite woman who leads black raiders. They harry the shipping and have sent many a good tradesman to the bottom. The pirate queen, Belit, hunts the waters in which Conan and his crew sail for vulnerable ships ripe for plunder. The crew only make it to the next sunrise before Belit's ship, the Tigris, appears on the horizon and attempts to raid the ship. Around the long point of an island off the starboard bow glided a long, lethal shape, a slender serpentine galley with a raised deck that ran from stem to stern. Belit! yelled Tito, hailing. 
Bend to it, dogs! roared Tito with a passionate gesture of his brawny fist. The timbers of the stout little galley creaked and groaned as the men fairly ripped her through the water. The wind had fallen, the sail hung limp. Nearer crept the inexorable raiders, and they were still a good mile from the surf when one of the steersmen fell gagging across the sweep, a long arrow through his neck. Tito sprang to take his place, and Conan, bracing his feet wide on the heaving poop deck, lifted his bow. He could see the details of the pirate plainly now. On the raised platform in the bows stood a slim figure whose white skin glistened in dazzling contrast to the glossy ebon hides about it. Belit, without a doubt. In desperation, the sailors abandoned their oars and snatched up their weapons. It was valiant, but useless. They had time for one flight of arrows before the pirate was upon them. The fight on the Argus was short and bloody. The stocky sailors, no match for the tall barbarians, were cut down to a man. Conan, on the high-pitched poop, was on a level with the pirate's deck. Then, with a burst of fury that left a heap of mangled corpses along the gunwales, Conan was over the rail and on the deck of the Tigris. Spears bent on his armor, or swished empty air, and his sword sang its death song. The fighting madness of his race was upon him, and with a red mist of unreasoning fury wavering before his blazing eyes, he cleft skulls, smashed breasts, severed limbs, ripped out entrails, and littered the deck like a shambles with a ghastly harvest of brains and blood. Then, as they lifted their spears to cast them, and he tensed himself to leap and die in the midst of them, a shrill cry froze the lifted arms. Baelit sprang before the blacks, beating down their spears. Fierce fingers of wonder caught at his heart. She was slender, yet formed like a goddess, at once lithe and voluptuous. Her only garment was a broad silken girdle. Her white ivory limbs and the ivory globes of her breasts drove a beat of fierce passion through the Cimmerian's pulse. Her rich black hair, black as a Stygian night, fell in rippling burnished clusters down on her supple back. Her dark eyes burned on the Cimmerian. She was untamed as a desert wind, supple and dangerous as a she-panther. Her red lips parted as she stared up into his somber, menacing eyes. Who are you? she demanded. By Ishtar, I have never seen your like. Though I have ranged the sea from the coasts of Zingara to the fires of the ultimate south. Whence come you? I am Conan, a Cimmerian, he answered. With the unerring instinct of the elemental feminine, she knew she had found her lover, and his race meant not, save as it invested him with the glamour of far lands. And I am Belit, she cried, as one might say, I am queen. Look at me, Conan. She threw wide her arms. I am Belit, queen of the Black Coast. O oh, tiger of the north, you are cold as the snowy mountains which bred you. Take me and crush me with your fierce love. Go with me to the ends of the earth and the ends of the sea. I am a queen by fire and steel and slaughter. Be thou my king! His eyes swept the blood-stained ranks, seeking expressions of wrath or jealousy. He saw none. The fury was gone from the ebon faces. He realized that to these men, Baelit was more than a woman, a goddess whose will was unquestioned. He glanced at the blue-fringed shore, at the far green hazes of the ocean, at the vibrant figure which stood before him, and his barbaric soul stirred within him. To quest these shining blue realms with that white-skinned younger tiger cat, to love, laugh, wander, and pillage. I'll sail with you, he grunted, shaking the red drops from his blade. Conan joins with his new pirate queen and sets out to raid the villages of the Black Coast with her.
The two plunder the riches of many people together, with Belit as the mastermind of their operation and Conan the warrior executor of her will. Some time passes, and eventually, the pirates sail into the dark and murky river Zarkaheba. Belit tells her king that the waters are poisonous, and only venomous reptiles lurk in its depths. She says that she once followed a Stygian galley she sought to rob into the river. After some time, the ship vanished and Belit anchored the Tigris so that they wouldn't miss the ship's return back down the river. After a few days, the galley floated back down the river, completely deserted and covered in blood. The pirate queen tells her lover that she wishes to find what she believes is a lost city, somewhere down the river, obscured by the darkness of Zarkaheba's banks. With little hesitation, Conan agrees, and the pirates journey up the river towards the mystery and terror that lies ahead. Other than a gigantic python that eats one of the crew members, Conan, Belit, and their crew encounter little else but eerie shrieks coming from the distant shores of the river during their journey. Eventually, the city Belit believed to be hidden within the mists of the river comes into focus on the horizon. It was but the ghost of a city on which they looked when they cleared a jutting jungle-clad point and swung in toward the incurving shore. Weeds and rank river grass grew between the stones of broken piers and shattered paves that had once been streets and spacious plazas and broad courts. From all sides except that toward the river, the jungle crept in, masking fallen columns and crumbling mounds with poisonous green. Here and there, buckling towers reeled drunkenly against the morning sky, and broken pillars jutted up among the decaying walls. In the center space, a marble pyramid was spired by a slim column, and on its pinnacle sat or squatted something that Conan supposed to be an image until his keen eyes detected life in it. It is a great bird! said one of the warriors, standing in the bows. It is a monster bat, insisted another. It is an ape, said Baylit. Just then, the creature spread broad wings and flapped off into the jungle. A winged ape, said old Nayaga uneasily. Better we had cut our throats than come to this place. It is haunted. Belit, Conan, and their crew disembark and wander into a nearby temple ruin. Once inside, Belit orders her men to lift the top off of a massive altar. Removing the altar causes a part of the temple to collapse on the men who had lifted it. But underneath, undreamable wealth in precious gems shine up into Belit's greedy eyes. The pirate queen orders her men to take the riches back to the ship, before they notice the winged ape they had spied earlier swooping over their vessel. Conan investigates and finds that the ape had destroyed the crew's water supply. Frustrated, the barbarian remarks that the crew can hardly drink the poisonous river water and offers to take 20 men into the jungle to find an alternative source of fresh water, while Belit loads the riches onto her ship. After a while of trudging through the underbrush of the jungle, Conan pauses and tells the crewmen he had brought with him to march ahead. Some noise behind them kept the barbarian's ears on high alert. He thinks that something may be following them, and hangs back as his crew marches past him. As everyone shuffles past him, Conan suddenly realizes that the air around him seems thicker. A pungent scent pollutes his senses. He turns and brushes against a black lotus blossom, whose scent brings dream-haunted slumber to whoever smells it. The Sumerian suddenly grows weak, unable to lift his sword and falls into a deep, unconscious sleep. While Conan dreams, his mind conjures some strange and horrifying images. The winds blew, 
and a vortex formed, a whirling pyramid of roaring blackness. From it grew shape and dimension. Then suddenly, like clouds dispersing, the darkness rolled away on either hand, and a huge city of dark green stone rose on the bank of a wide river, flowing through an illimitable plain. Through this city moved beings of alien configuration. Cast in the mold of humanity, they were distinctly not men. They were winged and of heroic proportions. Not a branch on the mysterious stock of evolution that culminated in man, but the ripe blossom on an alien tree separate and apart from that stock. Aside from their wings, in physical appearance they resembled man only as man in his highest form resembles the great apes. In spiritual, aesthetic, and intellectual development, they were superior to man, as man is superior to the gorilla. But when they reared their colossal city, man's primal ancestors had not yet risen from the slime of the primordial seas. These beings were mortal, as are all things built of flesh and blood. They lived, loved, and died, though the individual span of life was enormous. Then, after uncounted millions of years, the change began. The vista shimmered and wavered like a picture thrown on a wind-blown curtain. Over the city and the land, the ages flowed as waves flow over a beach, and each wave brought alterations. Somewhere on the planet, the magnetic centers were shifting. The great glaciers and ice fields were withdrawing toward the new poles. The littoral of the great river altered. Plains turned into swamps that stank with reptilian life. Where fertile meadows had rolled, forests reared up, growing into dank jungles. The changing ages wrought on the inhabitants of the city as well. They did not migrate to fresher lands. Reasons inexplicable to humanity held them to the ancient city and their doom. And as that once rich and mighty land sank deeper and deeper into the black mire of the sunless jungle, so into the chaos of squalling jungle life sank the people of the city. Terrific convulsions shook the earth. The nights were lurid with spouting volcanoes that fringed the dark horizons with red pillars. After an earthquake that shook down the outer walls and highest towers of the city, and caused the river to run black for days with some lethal substance spewed up from the subterranean depths, a frightful chemical change became apparent in the waters the folk had drunk from millenniums uncountable. Many died who drank of it, and in those who lived, the drinking wrought change, subtle, gradual, and grisly. In adapting themselves to the changing conditions, they had sunk far below their original level, but the lethal waters altered them even more horribly from generation to more bestial generation. They who had been winged gods became pinioned demons, with all that remained of their ancestors' vast knowledge distorted and perverted and twisted into ghastly paths. As they had risen higher than mankind might dream, so they sank lower than man's maddest nightmares reach. They died fast, by cannibalism and horrible feuds fought out in the murk of the midnight jungle. And at last, among the lichen-grown ruins of their city, only a single shape lurked, a stunted, abhorrent perversion of nature. These horrific images of the origins of the flying ape they had seen earlier, and the long-dead civilization that had produced it, shake Conan from his nightmare. He regains his senses, and begins frantically searching for the men he had led into the jungle. The Sumerian finds no trace of the men, except for litterings of the men's equipment and weapons scattered about the glade, as if they had panicked and fled from some horrific sight. Conan sprints through the jungle, hoping to find whatever of his men remains. When he happens upon one of them, the pirate is crouching, 
with froth dripping from his lips, his eyes rolled back, displaying only the whites of his eyes. The man was clearly mad, and rushes towards Conan in an attempt to murder the barbarian with his bare hands. Luckily, Conan hadn't abandoned his sword earlier, and drives it through the pirate's body, killing him. The barbarian then rushes back to the ship, hoping desperately that no harm had come to Belit and the rest of their crew. What he finds tears at the barbarian's soul. He sees Belit's lifeless form, strung up on the mast of her own ship, with her throat still glimmering red with fresh blood. Conan takes down Belit's body and respectfully wraps her in his scarlet cloak, just before a pack of ravenous hyenas emerge from the jungle. Conan picks some of them off with his bow, and then resorts to cutting them down with his blade when the rest of the ravenous mob reaches him. The winged ape swoops in to assist his pawns, and attacks the heartbroken barbarian. As he reeled on wide braced legs, sobbing for breath, the jungle and the moon swimming bloodily to his sight. The thrash of bat wings was loud in his ears. Instead of attack from the air, the pyramid staggered suddenly and awfully beneath his feet. He heard a rumbling crackle and saw the tall column above him wave like a wand. Stung to galvanized life, he bounded far out. His feet hit a step halfway down, which rocked beneath him, and his next desperate leap carried him clear. But even as his heels hit the earth, with a shattering crash like a breaking mountain, the pyramid crumpled. The column came thundering down in bursting fragments. Conan stirred, throwing off the splinters that half covered him. A glancing blow had knocked off his helmet and momentarily stunned him. Across his legs lay a great piece of the column pinning him down. Then, something swept down across the stars and struck the sward near him. Twisting about, he saw it. The Winged One. With fearful speed, it was rushing upon him. And in that instant, Conan had only a confused impression of a gigantic man-like shape hurtling along on bowed and stunted legs of huge, hairy arms outstretching misshapen, black-nailed paws, of a malformed head in whose broad face the only features recognizable as such were a pair of blood-red eyes. It was a thing neither man, beast, nor devil, imbued with characteristics subhuman as well as characteristics superhuman. The headlong rush of the Winged One had not wavered, it towered over the prostrate Cimmerian like a black shadow, arms thrown wide. A glimmer of white flashed between it and its victim. In one mad instant, she was there. A tense white shape, vibrant with love, fierce as a she-panther's. The dazed Cimmerian saw between him and the onrushing death her lithe figure, shimmering like ivory beneath the moon. He saw the blaze of her dark eyes, the thick cluster of her burnished hair. Her bosom heaved. Her red lips were parted. She cried out, sharp and ringing as the ring of steel, as she thrust at the winged monster's breast. Belit! screamed Conan. She flashed a quick glance toward him, and in her dark eyes he saw her love flaming. A naked elemental thing of raw fire and molten lava. Then she was gone, and the Cimmerian saw only the winged fiend which had staggered back in unwanted fear, arms lifted as if to fend off attack. And he knew that Baylit in truth lay on her pyre on the Tigress's deck. In his ears rang her passionate cry, Were I still in death, and you fighting for life, I would come back from the abyss. With a terrible cry, he heaved upward, hurling the stone aside. The winged one came on again, and Conan sprang to meet it, his veins on fire with madness. The thews started out like cords on his forearms as he swung his great sword, 
pivoting on his heel with the force of the sweeping arc. Just above the hips it caught the hurtling shape, and the knotted legs fell one way, the torso another, as the blade sheared clear through its hairy body. The red eyes glared up at him with awful life, then glazed and set. The great hands nodded spasmodically and stiffened, and the oldest race in the world was extinct. Amazed at his victory and the apparition of Belit that had come from beyond the grave to rescue the man she loved with all of her heart, Conan rests for a moment. But just for a moment, however, as the somber barbarian begins to prepare a funeral pyre for his love. Again, dawn tinged the ocean. A redder glow lit the river mouth. Conan of Cimmeria leaned on his great sword upon the white beach, watching the Tigress swinging out on her last voyage. There was no light in his eyes that contemplated the glassy swells. Out of the rolling blue wastes, all glory and wonder had gone. A fierce revulsion shook him as he gazed at the green surges that deepened into purple hazes of mystery. Belit had been of the sea. She had lent its splendor and allure. Without her, it rolled a barren, dreary, and desolate waste from pole to pole. She belonged to the sea. To its everlasting mystery, he returned her. He could do no more. No hand was at the sweep of the Tigris. No oars drove her through the green water. But a clean, tanging wind belied her silken sail, and as a wild swan cleaves the sky to her nest, she sped seaward, flames mounting higher and higher from her deck to lick at the mast and envelop the figure that lay lapped in scarlet on the shining pyre. So passed the Queen of the Black Coast, and leaning on his red-stained sword, Conan stood silently until the red glow had faded far out in the blue hazes, and dawn splashed its rose and gold over the ocean. Queen of the Black Coast is perhaps the most famous of this middle period of Conan stories. Even Quentin Tarantino likes it. Um, one of the things that I've always said is uh, no one has really done a true Robert E. Howard Conan movie. Oh, no, they haven't. They really haven't. They, they never really nailed it. And I was always secretly hoping that you oh. <laughs> would take over. Well, Robert is the, Robert Rodriguez is the one who really wanted to do a Conan. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, he because be well, Robert, he's like, hey, Robert E. Howard, he's a Texan. All yeah. right, you know? Yeah. And, you know. Conan is a Texas creation. Yep. You know? And um, if I did, it would, it would probably be... A, uh, uh, I love the comic series where they did the whole... Uh, um, uh, 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 one of the short stories was like uh, Queen of the Golden Pearl or whatever it is. The one where the, the, the there's the, the one pirate queen that has all those black African guys as, mm -hmm. as, as, as her crew. Well, um, they had Conan meet her in one of the comic books. And then, but you know, the, the entire journey that they have is a short story. So you never learn about the entire journey. You just learn how he gets with her and then how, uh, how it ends. But they did like a, a 20 issue run where they just where it was like for two two years they just go through the entire voyage that he had with her in the comics and, and it's one of the greatest runs of the comic that there really is. yeah what, what year was this around like uh if i'm not mistaken i think like around the at the height of the comic book's popularity so i'm thinking like 77 78 i was really hoping it's like queen of the golden pearl i can't remember the name of the of the, of the story I'd like to say right off that I too certainly count this one among my favorites at this point. The reason why I and so many others seem to like this story so much is mainly because of Belit, uh, the woman that Conan fans and writers have decided is Conan's one true love. I think that Belit is my personal favorite Conan uh, love interest so far because of the historical figure that she's likely based on and how well she matches the kind of wild man that Conan is. Robert E. Howard was of Irish descent, like myself, 
and his knowledge of Celtic history made its way into his work. Conan and his people, the Sumerians, are partially based on the Celts, the people who lived in Ireland going all the way back to ancient times and many other places across Europe. The Irish and British people have a long history of conflict that I won't get into fully here, but one of the most famous figures in the Irish independence movement during the 16th century is a woman named Grace O'Malley, also known as Ireland's Pirate Queen. O'Malley was born into a clan of petty nobility. Her father was the Baron of Marisk, a territory on the west coast of Ireland. The O'Malley clan had built their wealth as a seafaring people, who demanded tribute from all those who sailed in their waters. According to Irish legend, when O'Malley was just a child, she had a thirst for adventure, and asked her father if she could accompany him on a trading mission to Spain with his fleet of ships. Her father initially refused. He told Grace that her long hair would get tangled in the ship's ropes. Undeterred, the rebellious child supposedly cut off all her hair, dressed as a male sailor, and snuck aboard her father's ship. After this stunt, Grace's father allowed her to come along on the trading mission. When she grew older, Grace inherited her father's fleet of ships and his title as Baroness. This is despite the fact that she had a male half-brother who would have been the traditional heir of their father's legacy. With her father's naval power, Grace set upon the seas as a pirate, raiding villages and demanding tribute from all the people of Ireland's west coast. Her power and influence grew so large that she eventually became known as the Pirate Queen of Connacht, one of the largest regions in Ireland. Grace O'Malley was said to be a fierce warrior queen. In the tradition of other Celtic warrior queens from history like Boudicca, the leader of a British Celtic tribe who led a rebellion against their Roman oppressors in 61 AD. One legend says that O'Malley gave birth to one of her children at sea aboard a ship. The next day, Corsairs attacked the ship and nearly defeated her men. O'Malley, likely still reeling from the pains of giving birth, cursed her crew's ineffectiveness and proceeded to personally lead them in battle to a narrow victory. Like Belit, Grace O'Malley was a woman of fierce passions. She was married three times. Her first husband was a man named Donal O'Flaherty. O'Flaherty was an Irish nobleman who belonged to a seafaring clan allied with the O'Malleys. Donal was killed in an ambush by a rival clan who sought to invade O'Flaherty's holdings, with only, in their words, a woman left to defend them. When the rival clan invaded her lands, O'Malley waged a counteroffensive so fierce and vengeful that legends compared her to a hen protecting her brood. The castle she successfully defended still bears the name Hen's Castle to this very day in honor of her axe. After her husband's death, stories say that Grace took a lover, a shipwrecked sailor that she loved intensely. Shortly after their whirlwind affair began, the sailor was murdered by a rival clan. O'Malley once again flew into a vengeful rage and attacked the clan's castle, Duna, in Blacksod Bay. Her successful offensive during that battle earned her the nickname the Dark Lady of Duna. For generations of Irish people after her death, Grace O'Malley remained a symbol of the Irish people's spirit and independence. During O'Malley's reign as the Pirate Queen, Queen Elizabeth I of England was attempting to assert British control over the Irish island. The Queen pursued a policy of divide and conquer in which English magistrates would bribe Irish tribal leaders to act as their puppets and suppress other clans that the English viewed as obstacles to their political dominance of Ireland. O'Malley was one of the Irish leaders who opposed English enroachment on their society. She was captured by the English and imprisoned for a time before she was released on good behavior and continued to wage war on the English magistrates immediately afterwards. The English retaliated by killing one of Grace's sons, and instead of meeting with the magistrate she was warring with, the Pirate Queen arranged a meeting with Elizabeth I herself to settle the dispute. The two queens negotiated, and came to the agreement that Elizabeth would release two of O'Malley's other children, whom the British held prisoner, and leave O'Malley alone to rule in her own domain. In exchange, Grace would pledge 200 pirates, 
and her entire fleet to the command of the British Crown, for the purpose of keeping the peace in Ireland. Shortly after the negotiations concluded and she got her kids back, O'Malley proceeded to pledge ships to the Irish rebels fighting against the British instead. As you can see, most people like Grace O'Malley, Belit, and Conan, warriors, conquerors, and monarchs, are people who elicit very different feelings in people depending on who they are and where they come from. To those who find themselves at the end of these warriors' blades, these sorts of people appear as crazed tyrants, thieves, and murderers. To their friends, families, and countrymen, however, they are viewed as heroic figures, filled with deep passion for their people. This is why Belit is a perfect love interest for Conan. She's a strong-willed, passionate warrior woman. Like Conan would later on in his life, Belit is a queen by her own hand, not by birth or inheritance did she claim her power. Instead, she sailed the seas and conquered them, accumulating wealth and power in her various raids. Like Grace O'Malley, Belit came from relative obscurity and carved an empire of her own. If Belit had lived longer, maybe she too would have become powerful enough to negotiate with the king of a mighty nation like Aquilonia, the most powerful kingdom in the Hyborian Age. She loves Conan just as intensely as Grace O'Malley loved the shipwrecked sailor she raided a castle for. Belit appears as a ghost to save her doomed lover from certain death. In Howard's story, the fearsome and vengeful warrior queen is the one who dies instead of her shipwrecked lover. This woman is the only one Conan has met thus far in these stories that is equal to him in his lust for blood and plunder and his skills in war. She's the first woman we've seen that has been able to ignite fierce love and loyalty in the Barbarian. In prior stories, Conan has had different reactions to the various women he meets throughout his adventures. He can honestly be sort of casually sexist at times, and he's an emotionally distant man of very few words. However, he's also been shown to be a loyal protector to many women throughout these Howard Conan stories, and even shown romantic interest in some of them. However, um, quite a few of the women that we see in the prior stories have some sort of regal or otherwise civilized background. They haven't had to experience the kind of life that Conan has lived, the life of a tribal warrior fighting every day just to survive. However, Belit has. She's the only woman Conan has met thus far that would take as much pleasure in the arts of war and theft as he does. Whatever sexist attitudes Conan has are not really present in this story. He willingly accepts his role as the sword arm to Belit's tactical and devious mind. He's perfectly content following Belit's orders and doing whatever is asked of him by her. He does truly surrender himself to this woman that he loves. As does Belit to her king, the only thing in the story we see that can divert her attention away from the love she feels for Conan is the prospect of stealing large amounts of wealth. Belit and Conan feel like a perfect match for each other, star-crossed lovers destined to see their passion for each other be ruined by tragedy. Indeed, it is Belit's own greed that ends up destroying their love, as she insists on loading the extravagant wealth that the pirates find in the lost city while Conan goes to search for much needed supplies, separating the two, and leaving Belit ripe for the picking. And yet the love between the two of them is so strong, it transcends death itself. At the end of the story, Belit dies as she lived, a star that burned bright, forged legends of her triumphs and trials in history, and then quickly burned out. This really does feel like a mythic love story of old, and it makes Belit and Conan's relationship feel real. Belit is by far the most unique and well-realized female character in any of Howard's stories thus far, and she's definitely my favorite, I have to say. While Belit's character and her relationship with Conan is by far my favorite part of the story, there are also other really fascinating aspects of it. 
The civilization of winged men who eventually fell due to a civil war between them is also really fascinating. One of the things that Howard likes to do in his stories is introduce realistic, at least within his universe, versions of myths that existed in our world. The basic implication being that all the mythological tales that humans have carried with us throughout our history have some basis in fact. For example, let's say that a man like Hercules did exist, for example, at one point in history. In Howard's conception, Hercules would be such an extraordinary man that legends would be told about him. Over time, these legends, these stories, would become mythical tales with otherworldly creatures, gods, and evil demons. One can imagine how such true stories could be exaggerated in an age where storytelling was passed from one generation to the next via oral tradition or written in records so perishable that they could be destroyed at any time, whenever the library they rested in was sacked by some invading army or burned down. It's easy to understand how such an extraordinary person may become a mythical hero after a few generations of the game of telephone being played on a civilizational scale. This dream that Conan has, which documents the rise and fall of this civilization of winged creatures that have some resemblance to humanity at first, and then eventually devolves into some terrifying winged apes, reminded me of a particular story from Christian theology. In the New Testament, the Bible speaks of a war between two groups of angels, the winged servants of the Christian God. In the story, the War of Angels is described as a conflict between a group of rebellious angels led by Lucifer and a group of angels loyal to the Christian God and led by the archangel Michael. It is said that Lucifer, upon hearing about God's plan for the universe he had created, in which his creation, humanity, would not have free will, the angel came to see God as a tyrant. He believed that humanity should be unshackled from God's predestination plans. So he assembled a rebel faction to fight against the angels loyal to God and take his place as the ruler of heaven. These rebels lost their war with Michael's loyalist faction and were banished from heaven to hell for all eternity. These fallen angels eventually became consumed by evil, which transformed them into the demons we usually associate with creatures from hell. In Conan's dreams, we see a civilization of godlike winged men. They had an extremely advanced civilization that people like Conan and those humans who had encountered them centuries ago would regard as paradise. After years and years of pollution, infighting, and an inability to adjust their civilization to the changing conditions of the world, these winged godlike beings were transformed. They eventually devolved into gigantic winged apes, returning to the primal state from which they had originally evolved over thousands of years, such as the cycle of civilizations in Howard's world. It is conceivable in Howard's world that in an age thousands and thousands of years before the recorded history of mankind, that there was some kind of winged primate species that had a civilization so advanced that primitive humans may have seen them as possessing some level of divinity and tell stories about them. I also like that in this story, the reasons that this angelic civilization fell are realistic things that plague all civilizations. Unchecked consumption that causes pollution and devolution of the civilization's people and culture. Traditionalist policies that fail to deal with the ever-changing circumstances of the time and internal divisions so fierce that the civilization enters a suicidal death spiral where citizens wage war on each other. This, again, is one of the central themes of Howard's stories. Civilizations rise to a level of decadence, power, and influence before unseen. After some time, as the reigning civilization in its domain, this powerful society eventually begins to decline, die, and decay. This leaves a power vacuum for the next up-and-coming civilization to rise and take its place. 
This is, of course, a theme we've seen explored in many other prior Howard Conan stories, but getting to see it uh, through what at least this story refers to as the oldest civilization in the world and their connection to ideas in Christian theology really interested me. Other than the love story and the bits about this lost angelic civilization, I also just really liked how melancholy of a story this is. The prior Conan stories take place in a bleak, dark, and unforgiving world. However, they still are, at their core, swashbuckling adventure stories. There's a reason why Weird Tales editorial wanted these stories, to end with Conan's version of a happy ending, a pretty woman by his side, and the prospect of great wealth to steal in his future. Queen of the Black Coast ends on a tragic note. Conan loses the love of his life, and ends the story staring at the burning ship that is his love's grave, slowly fading into the distance and becoming submerged by the sea. He can't even stand to imagine the sea as a place full of plunder without Belit by his side. He associates the sea with the adventures he had had on it with his love, and losing her causes him so much pain that he can barely stand to look upon it. I really like how different this story is from the other middle period Conan stories in this regard, and it makes this one stand out amongst them. While Queen of the Black Coast shares the pirate motif with the Pool of the Black One and Iron Shadows in the Moon, I think this story has the best use of that kind of pirate coat of paint of those three stories. This story spans a vast amount of time, so it feels like we live with Conan in the status quo as a pirate for a while, and it feels like an epic adventure. The last thing I'll mention before I end off with the review here is that there is something from this story that made its way into the first Conan the Barbarian movie. At the end of that film, during its final battle, Valeria appears as a ghost dressed in the armor of a Norse Valkyrie. <laughs> Do you want to live forever? This appearance of Valeria as a ghost, who came back to help her love during the fight of his life, was inspired by Belit's ghost in this story. The idea of putting her in a Valkyrie costume came, well, <laughs> from John Milius having a crush on the actress who played Valeria, Sandal Bergman, that borders on being kind of creepy, I have to be honest. Look how great Sandal looks there. Oh, I know. Look at that wonderful Viking face she has. Yeah. When I saw Sandal, I fell in love. I mean, Sandal is a Valkyrie. Where is she now? I saw her not, about a year ago. She looked great, but she's a Valkyrie. So that she becomes a Valkyrie. There she is as a Valkyrie. That is a Valkyrie. Valkyrie, Valkyrie, Valkyrie. On that note, <laughs> I think I've explored all of my thoughts on Queen of the Black Coast. I have to say that as of right now, it definitely ranks amongst my favorite Conan stories. I'd have to say that at this point, Queen of the Black Coast is probably my second favorite Conan story, just slightly behind the Slithering Shadow and slightly above Rogues in the House at that number three slot. I'd highly recommend this one. I think it's probably one of the definitive Howard Conan stories. All right, so we're at the end here of my review and retrospective of Queen of the Black Coast. I'd like to thank everyone for watching, but before I let you go, I'd like to say a few words regarding how you can experience this story yourself and support the show if you're so inclined. So the description below contains all of the goodies I'm gonna be mentioning here. So in the description below, 
I have a link to a free audiobook of Queen of the Black Coast there for your listening pleasure. It's uh, free to watch on YouTube, so definitely check it out if um, you don't really have time to sit down and uh, do a, you know, prose reading of these stories. I find that's the best way for me to fit experiencing these stories into my schedule. If you enjoyed the video, it would mean quite a bit to me if you subscribed to the channel, liked the video, and posted your thoughts on this story, my video, or anything else Conan related in the comments below. These engagements with the video here on the channel help Conan Chronicles get recommended to more people as they surf YouTube looking for things to watch. I've also set up a Patreon for Conan Chronicles where you can support the show monetarily, and any amount you can ship in really helps us. Um, I've already uploaded the first episode of our Patreon exclusive podcast called the Grog House Podcast to the main channel here. So um, check that out as kind of a preview of what you get as a Patreon of Conan Chronicles. And if you'd like to listen to more of me and Josh discuss all manner of things Conan, um, definitely subscribe to the Patreon. Conan Chronicles is also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so if you never want to miss an episode, get updates on the show, and see some awesome pieces of Conan artwork, check out these pages as well. With all of that said, I'd like to invite you, dear listener, to join me for the next episode. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at the 11th story in Conan's publication history, The Devil in Iron. Until next time we meet, dear listener, I bid you farewell. He saw a tall, powerfully built figure in a black scale mail halberd, burnished greaves and a blue steel helmet from which jutted bull's horns, highly polished. From the mailed shoulders fell the scarlet cloak, blowing in the sea wind. A broad chagrin belt with a golden buckle held the scabbard of the broadsword he bore. Under the horned helmet, a square-cut black mane contrasted with smoldering blue eyes. I am Conan, a Cimmerian, by Krom, though I've spent considerable time among you civilized peoples. Your ways are still beyond my comprehension. Well, last night in a tavern, a captain in the King's Guard offered violence to the sweetheart of a young soldier, who naturally ran him through. But it seems there is some cursed law against killing guardsmen and the boy and his girl fled away. It was bruited about that I was seen with them, and so today I was hailed into court, and a judge asked me where the lad had gone. I replied that since he was a friend of mine, I could not betray him. Then the court waxed wroth, and the judge talked a great deal about my duty to the state, and society, and other things I did not understand and bade me tell where my friend had flown. By this time I was becoming wrathful myself, for I had explained my position. But I choked my ire and held my peace, and the judge squalled that I had shown contempt for the court, and that I should be hurled into a dungeon to rot until I betrayed my friend. So then, seeing they were all mad, I drew my sword and cleft the judge's skull, then I cut my way out of the court, and seeing the High Constable's stallion tied nearby, I rode for the wharfs, where I thought to find a ship bound for foreign parts. 